Let's bow before uh, the Lord this morning as we open his word. Jesus, we thank you for your word. The truth of your word, God, is paramount in how we navigate through this life. God, we thank you for the gift that you've given us. We thank you that we can go to you for insight and wisdom and your Holy Spirit, Lord, quickens the things that are found in your word and applies them to our everyday living and brings them alive. God, we thank you for the privilege we have in this free country of studying your word and openly preaching your word. God, we know that brothers and sisters overseas in different places don't have that freedom, so we don't ever want to take that for granted, but we thank you, God, for your word. And I pray, God, this morning that as we continue... Um, my series in First John, Lord, that you would give me insight and help me to speak the words that you would have me to speak this morning for people that are here today and online. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we're going to be wrapping, well, I got one more week. We're getting close to wrapping up um, First John, and First John has been a a very good book for us to pour through because John brings out some very pivotal things that are essential for Christians to get. And for, for the, this series, um, John, when you read the book of 1 John, you see his pastoral heart come out. And, and, and he really wants people to understand what it means to be a Christian with your feet on the ground and how you're living your life. And, 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 and he wants people to really think about um, what's really, truly important. And First John is all about love, about learning about God's love and learning how to love others the same way that God loves us. So my text this morning... Um, We'll be in 1 John chapter 5. Now, two weeks ago, um, we kind of did this, the hopscotch. I preached the last part of 1 John 3 last week, but the week before, my, uh, my brother-in-law, John Kendrick, preached 1 John chapter 4. So we're moving on to 1 John chapter 5 here. And um, at the end of chapter 4, John made a statement of duty, I guess you could say, to the believers that if we love God, we were also supposed to love our brothers and sisters and Him in the same manner. Now, in chapter 5, John brings out some things that are, are, are essential in understanding this whole theme of love. In fact, in chapter 5, John brings out the fact that faith, love, and obedience, those three things, faith, love, and obedience, they're inseparably linked together as the primary marks that characterize the life of true Christians. Now, you can't separate faith, love, and obedience. You can't separate them. You can't have faith but no love and no obedience. You can't have uh, love without faith and obedience, God's love. You can't have that without, without um, faith and obedience. And you can't have faith or love without obedience. And so many people get this wrong because they're approaching it from a fleshly, worldly mindset. But when God's Holy Spirit enters you as a believer, things change. They come together as a package. Faith, love, and obedience come together as a package. You might say they're the spiritual DNA of a person who is born again. When God's forgiveness is applied to your life and the Holy Spirit enters your spirit, um, things happen. There's cleansing. There's change. And if there's no change, you have to wonder was there actually ever a conversion? Because with people who claim to be believers, 
there is a tangible change from the way you are after you take Christ as your Savior than there was before. There ought to be a marked difference. So John delves into this thought in our text this morning in 1 John 5, where it is written. Starting with verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Now, some people that I've bumped into out there, you've bumped into them too, um, they, said, they say t- to you when you talk to them about their faith or what they believe in, they, s- they, f- they say that they don't feel that they are good enough to be Christians. You ever heard that? I'm not good enough to be a Christian. There's no way I could possibly live that lifestyle. And having looked at other people who claim to be believers, some of them have, been co- have become disenfranchised. And uh, they're convinced that um, when they look at people that aren't living the life that they say they believe, when they're looking at them, they're, they're, they're saying to themselves, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be two-faced, claiming to be a Christian, but living a large part of what I do in opposition to what I say I believe. So I'm, not, I'm just going to flat out push away from Christianity and do what I want. Huh, peace. Whew. Well, so they say. There's, there's, there's some people that have pushed away from the table. They settle into a life of sin. And they hurt, their conscience gets harder and harder and harder as they live that way. But a lot of it sometimes starts when people are looking at the Christian faith as a system of do's and don'ts. And they say, I can't be that way, so why even try? Why even try? So, some people misunderstand the nature of God's offer of salvation to humanity. They think that they must change or be capable of changing to be a good church person before they could ever consider becoming a Christian. But they don't realize that when a person comes to Jesus, every single person comes just as they are to Him. Just as they are. With all their imperfection, bumps, lumps, and uh, scabs, and rough patches, ugly spots, whatever you want to call it, when a person comes to see Jesus for who He is, the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is helps them to recognize how much of a sinner they really are and how far they fall away from God's standard. You see, that, then the Holy Spirit convicts them and says, you need salvation. See, if you don't actually um, get that, you don't think you need salvation. Why would I need to be saved? From I'm perfectly fine the way I am. But when the Spirit of God moves upon a heart, He shows them, really, how much they need a Savior. He takes the blinders off. So a person no longer thinks more highly of themselves than they ought to. And they no longer underestimate the holiness of a God who spoke the universe into existence. So, now some of us were raised in Christian homes and maybe you've uh, given your heart to Christ somewhere along the line as you're growing up and you've never actually seen life outside of a Christian home. Well, that's God, Jesus does a work inside of kids that are raised like that and that's an awesome privilege actually to be raised in a family where you are shown the light of Christ, where God's love is evident in your family because not everyone gets to see that. And for those of you who have turned your life over to Jesus Christ later on in life, 
You understand what I'm talking about. The difference between darkness and light. Now, there is a book, and it's an old book, written by Chuck Colson, called Born Again. Chuck Colson was in the U.S. Uh, government, and he was involved in the Watergate scandal and all that stuff. But anyways, on that particular book, he became a Bible-believing, born-again Christian. And on the book cover, it shows this dark face and this light face, and his face going from dark to light. I, even as a kid, that captivated me. I'm like, man, that's kind of an interesting cover for a book. But you know, when Jesus Christ comes into your life, the darkness is removed. Your hardened heart is broken. And in place of a hard heart becomes this soft heart of flesh, a, a flesh heart that is sensitive to God. And I've heard people say, I've had people say that have given their hearts to Christ as older people. When they give their hearts to Christ, you look at them and their eyes are beaming. And it's just like, and they tell you, they'll even tell you, the flowers are brighter or, or more colorful. The sun seems to be shining brighter. And this peace in my heart, peace that I've never known, is inside of me. You know, as kids, if you're raised in a Christian home, you're kind of in the light all the time. It's like, okay, well, if you're in the light all the time, you don't really, re you get kind of used to it and you take it for granted, right? But you go into a very dark place and you shut off all the lights and you're left there and you can't see anything. As a kid, you understand, it's kind of scary. There's nothing around but darkness. And then when someone turns on the light, oh, I can see where I am. I'm safe. I'm in an okay place here. Oh, and now I can see where I'm going. You see? But if there's never darkness, you never learn to appreciate the light sometimes. Sometimes, kids, when you're raised in a Christian home, you, you can take it, it for granted that your, your family and you're being raised in an environment where there's light all the time. Don't forget this, okay? Just because you've been given a gift by God to walk in light from a very young age all the way through, okay? Don't forget that there is a very real darkness out there. And that darkness, you don't have to partake in that. You don't have to walk in darkness. You can walk in the light of Christ Parents, train up your children in the ways of Christ. Now, there is a principle that when they are old, they will not depart from it. Everyone's got free wills, and they can choose, right? But the principle is, yeah, if they see it being modeled at home, they're going to they're going to take on that as they become older. But sometimes people will choose to walk away, and they think that they're going to find something valuable in the darkness, but they're not. You see, when God saves a person, He fills a person with His love. Why? Because He, in fact, comes in and lives inside of your spirit. Kids, do you know this? When you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, the Holy Spirit, the creator of the universe, comes and makes His home right inside of you. So no longer are you over here and God's over here. God lives in you. And what I'm saying is, when He is living in you, there is a love inside of you that is beyond yourself. The love that is in you comes from God. The Holy Spirit's character, His primary character, is that of love. Now, love is intricately connected, God's love, to faith and obedience. That's why Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. Because love, the love of God, brings us into light. Into light. Into spiritual light. And um, <laughs> everyone, did you hear in the first part of our, our text this morning? Everyone who loves the Father loves this child as well. Well, if you love the Father God, you're going to love Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But you're also going to love the adopted children who are adopted into the family of God too. So, if my heart is bitter and sour towards everyone else around me, we have a problem here. We have a problem. 
That is not the mark of the Holy Spirit. The mark of the Holy Spirit is God's love. And that's what the light is. The love of God. So when I look at my brother or sister or I look at someone out there, I see them as Jesus sees them. I see them with God's perspective. And that's beautiful. And if I see them with that perspective and I am obedient and I believe, I am going to treat that person in a way that Jesus would want that person to be treated. And love is not selfish, right? So I don't look at people as commodities, as someone who can help me get this or help me get that or, you know. Sometimes people look at that. You know, oh, I, you know, they look at, they look at their life um, as their own, you know. I'm an island unto myself and I get what I can out of life and the people that are around me that, that give to me, get and pour into me, that's, that's love. That's who I love. Hold on. No. That's the love of the world. That's not the love of Christ. The love of Christ looks at every single person with compassion through the eyes of God and sees that person as a precious soul. As a precious soul. And how does that, how does that affect how I live in my family? How do I treat my parents? How do I treat my brothers and sisters? How do I treat my kids? How do I treat my relatives even when they're cranky and cantankerous? Sometimes they can be cranky and cantankerous. Love sees beyond the surface. It says, yeah, maybe if they're cranky and cantankerous, there's something going on in them and I need to come alongside them and do something to show them that I'm with them, that I care. And sometimes, you know, when someone's cranky and cantankerous, it's not a bad idea just to say, hey, is everything okay? I just noticed that you're not doing so well. If, if I can help in any way, I'd, I'd really like to help. You know, that's love. Lo love is, whew, it's feet on the ground. Love is not some airy-fairy feeling. Feelings come and go, but they're deceiving. Faith and love and obedience are active. They're active. I can't say that I love God and I go out and do whatever I want to do. And I can't say that if I love God that I shouldn't expect my brother or sister to come alongside me and to say, hey, maybe the way that you're going is going to hurt you because if I actually believe that they love me, I'm going to take that from them. And I'm going to let them speak into my life. If I'm going astray, I better expect that someone's going to hold me accountable because if nobody holds me accountable and I just go doing whatever I true want to do, that's not love. Love and obedience and faith are tied together. They're not separated. So if I love my kid and he's out there doing something crazy, I'm not going to give any examples because that's not fair. <laughs> Because I was a kid too and I did some crazy stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't have liked it if my dad pointed at it. No, every one of us has those times, right? But love comes alongside and says, hey, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't a good thing for you. Maybe you shouldn't be following this path. And, and that person loves me enough to risk the fact that I might just reject them and just push away from the table and say, whew, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I'm, if I love my kids, I'm going to discipline them or I'm going to bring stuff up that is uncomfortable. Nobody likes to be the angry dad. At least most people don't. I don't like to be the angry dad. Oh, do I have to do this again? You know, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but like even as a cop, right? Sometimes people would do crazy stuff and you'd go, well, you just had to do that. Ah. Oh. Now I've got to take you in. It's like, if you just shut your mouth and walk away, nothing would happen. We could go on with our day and everyone would be fine. But no, you had to start going like this and take a punch or whatever. You're, you, as a police. There's consequences. So if I'm loving my society, if I'm loving my family, if I'm loving my children, if I'm loving my church, there's going to be accountability. There has to be. Well, don't judge me. 
We talked, I talked with someone about this this morning. Don't judge me. God says you're not supposed to judge. No, God says you're not supposed to judge the world. That's what he says. Don't judge the world because they don't have the same spirit inside of them as you do. In family, you've got to make judgments all the time. What does it say? What, what does it say? That we're supposed to go to people when they've done wrong and talk to them about it. And if we don't do that, we don't actually, we're not showing the love of God because love, faith, and obedience are all wrapped up in the same package. And yes, you may just go, ooh, I don't like to be that person. Now, I'm not saying that we should be critically spirited because there is that too where it's like, you know, uh, twig, 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 log. But there's no sight of the log, you know? Twig, twig, twig. Oh, there's twigs everywhere, but there's no... We're not looking at the log here, right? <laughs> no, love is, love is relational. And if you're going to have good relationships, you have to have good communication, and you have to have good interaction. And if you don't, if something breaks down there, then there's separation, and there's coldness. There's not a family, okay? Well, what does John say here? He says, this is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out His commands, keeping his commands, but loving his children as well. Keeping his, can you love God, love, love others, and keep the commands of God? Yes, you can. It's there. The law of love, you know, like if, I, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm going to correct something um, that's taking place, I better do it in the right spirit. Because if I'm just like, you know, the church always shoots their wounded. That's what I hear sometimes. No, that sh- it shouldn't be that way, folks. We shouldn't shoot the wounded. They need, the go- they, need the- they need God's comfort and grace. Yes, but spoken in truth. Someone in the church decides to leave their spouse and start living with someone else in the church. You better believe the pastor and the board are going to get involved in that. Why? Because that's destructive and we love you. We don't want to see you destroy yourselves by following a path. So you might encounter some kind of discipline. As a pastor, if I start preaching heresy from this pulpit, I better expect that some of you guys should come to me and say, hey, man, I don't know about what you're saying there. Have you checked this out in the Word? You know, like maybe you should think about this. You know, like this isn't right. We've got to hold each other accountable. All of us. Okay, anyway. John, in the preceding chapter in 4, verses 7 and 8, said, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So everything we do has to be, has to be forged in love. By this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Out there, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony and revelation. There's going to be a great host of believers who will be with before the throne of God. They are the ones who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We, as born-again Christians who know Christ, overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony is so important. How we love each other in the context of family, how we love each other in the context of our fellowship will testify to the ones out there that there's something different in this light. Some people will go, hey, I want darkness. But there's others that are searching and they're going to go, what is it that you got that I don't have? What's inside it? What is with you people? What is with you guys? Like, I don't understand. What do you want? You must want something. That's why you're doing all this stuff, right? You must want extra brownie points with the angel up on the the computer up in heaven going, yeah, that's one more for Johnny. You must be doing that because you're you're trying to get something out of it, right? Because that's how the world understands it. The world is all out for me and what I can get, and if I'm nice to people, they'll give me what I want. No. We give people the love of God because they are precious to God because they are God's children and they are they are they are loved by him and the family of God in particular we're brothers and sisters co-heirs 
together with Christ. Isn't that beautiful? There's a unity in there. So we ought to treat one another like we're going to be spending the rest of eternity with each other because we are. And we might as well start here and now by loving one another the way Christ calls us to in obedience. For everyone in our text here this morning, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has, come, that has overcome the world, even our faith. God's love is manifested in a person who truly believes like the fruit from a certain kind of tree. And you're going to know the kind of person you're seeing by the fruit that hangs from the boughs of the branches in their life. So the, world, the, the Word of God is filled with all kinds of practical illustrations. So just picture this beautiful fruit tree with, laden with beautiful fruit that is tasty and good and, and, just, and, and healthy, wonderful. That tree is, is a tree that produces good fruit. You're not going to see some thistle bush producing grapes. The thistle bushes don't produce grapes. And if they do, it's all a, a mirage. It's a, it's a front to get something out of someone. I'm nice so that I can get what I want. It's like the salesman, you know. Oh, you got such a nice family. Look at this $95,000 car. Don't look at that $35,000 car. Look at the $95,000. Oh, what a beautiful kid. Hey, kids, want an ice cream? You know, like, no. That's not what we're talking, not manipulative. Not a salesman. Someone who genuinely cares from the heart. Matthew 7, 17b-20. Every good tree bears good fruit, but bad trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Everyone who is born of God, truly born of God, overcomes the world. The world that John is speaking of is not the natural world, but the spiritual world that is separated from God by disobedience and wickedness. Going back to 1 John 2.15, John clarifies this principle. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves this world, the love of the Father is not in them. And that verse goes on to explain. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So this verse is often interpreted as a warning against materialism and the pursuits of sinful pleasures and opposition to God's standards. So if my heart, where my treasure is, there my heart is. Where's my heart? This morning, where's my heart? God's asking. And sometimes, you know, folks, and I, I think, you know, there's times where our love waxes cold and we start to drift, we let something distract us from love, and we start to do things on our own strength and our own steam. You know, very soon, if you're not already experiencing the discipline of God, you will, if you're a true believer in Christ, God will not let you get away with that. He's going to discipline you. How that happens, I don't know. He is going to take care of that, though, and He's going to bring you back to your knees. Why? Because he loves you too much to let you go out on your own and do your own thing and be your own boss because that's the way of the world and that's the way of the sinner right from the beginning in the garden. 1 John 1.6, the apostle teaches, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So if the fruit on my life is not, I won't want to say, well, let's use... Uh, I don't know, cherries as an example, or apples, whatever. Good, it's not good fruit? Mm. God, where's my heart? Has it dried up? Am I not producing good fruit, the fruit of righteousness? The fruit that's, that this is talking about is a fruit of righteousness. Love, love and good trees bear the fruit of righteousness. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Who is it that overcomes the world? In verse 5 of our text this morning, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And we're talking true faith, true belief. If you 
are a true believer, God has given you the power to be a true overcomer. If you're a true believer, you will be a true overcomer. It doesn't mean that you're not going to fall down and bruise your knees up sometimes. But you are no longer bound by sin, by the chains of sin. The power of sin has been broken. You can choose to follow sin, but the power of sin is broken. You're no longer a slave to that if you're a true believer. So who overcomes the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So after, okay, so there John teaches this. So after teaching these things, John continues in his message to the church, clarifying something that needs to be clarified because it was becoming a real problem in the early church. Now during the early church history, right to the very age of the, uh, end of the age of the apostles, I should say, um, there was a teaching that started to arise which conflicted with the teachings of the apostles and message of the pure gospel. And, and these teachings uh, were known in the church age and you've seen it in the Bible in Revelation in the first three chapters where it talks about the, the, the practices and the teachings of the Nicolaitans, which the Lord des despises, which he hates. Okay? Um, the Nicolaitans were believed to be following what they call Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a huge thing that was taking root as the apostolic age started to close. Gnosticism started to take root within the fellowships. And um, I guess, John, if you look at this text this morning in 1 John 5, okay, the next piece of Scripture is a little confusing unless you understand what I'm going to explain to you because, of course, this book was written in a certain context and we always got to go to the context to understand what's trying to be put across here. Now, the Gnostics, okay, um, believed, and in, there's a good definition in the New Bible Dictionary, but the Gnostics believed that the supreme God dwelt in unapproachable splendor in this spiritual world, in the spiritual world. Um, he had no dealings. God could have no dealings. This supreme God had no dealings with the world of matter. Matter was evil. Um, Matter was the creation of an inferior being called Demurge. And he, Demur, Demur, Demiurge, Demiurge, okay, that's what they said, okay, Demiurge. Now, Demiurge was an under, uh, underling to the Supreme God. The Gnostics would say this, that he was an inferior being. And he, along with his aides, or the archons, kept mankind imprisoned within their material existence and barred the path of individual souls trying to ascend to the spirit world after death. So, in other words, all material things in the world are evil. Everything's evil. Absolutely everything. The possibility of ascending into the spirit world after death was not open to everyone. It was only opened up to a select few. You start to catch hints of maybe some of the heresies that are going around today. There's a certain cult of Christianity, namely the Jehovah's Witnesses, that teach there's only a select few that will make it through. Only the people who possess this divine spark or pneuma could ever hope of escaping from their material existence and entering this eternal life. Even these possessing such a spark didn't have an automatic escape. They needed to receive an enlightenment, an enlightenment of understanding or special knowledge from God, from the crea supreme creator, or gnosis, they call it, before they could become aware of their own spiritual condition and then repent. So even those possessing such a spark didn't have this um, natural propensity to seek the supreme creator that had to be um, enlightened. There had to be enlightenment that occurred here. In most of the Gnostic systems um, reported by the church fathers, this enlightenment was the work of a divine redeemer who descended from the spiritual world in disguise. And he is often equated as the Christian Jesus. So he's the spiritual person uh, that came down in disguise into the world as this really spiritual being who had this, he wasn't really the same as us, right? 
Salvation for the Gnostics was to recognize that they had been chosen to have the divine spark of God within them. And secondly, to be alerted to the presence of his special divine spark within them. And thirdly, as a result of the special knowledge that they've been given, proceed to escape death from the evil material world and enter the spiritual world. Now, I probably confuse all of you to death. <laughs> This was a prominent thing in the early church, folks. And it tore our churches apart. It was something that was spoken by the early church fathers against very vehemently. And they were saying, this is the teachings that were, were apostate to what was intended um, by God through Jesus Christ coming into the world to save humanity. This was all apostasy. And there's variations of Gnostic beliefs and they're rising here and there all over the place to, in today's society in different cults. But that's just kind of the basics of Gnostic beliefs. I just wanted to give you a crash course on it a little bit. Hopefully I didn't confuse you too much. But understanding the principle and context of what John writes next is pivotal in understanding the purpose of the way he worded this portion of his letter. This is the one, John says in verse 6 of our text, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. So what the Apostle John is trying to make clear to the churches here is that the Jesus that he is speaking of is not the Gnostic Jesus. He is not the phantom Jesus who was so holy that he had nothing to do with this material world and he just came kind of as a spirit being into this world. The Jesus we must believe in is the Jesus who came by water and blood, the Jesus who was part of the real material flesh and blood earth. In other words, Jesus was not only the Son of God, he was also equally the Son of Man. Jesus was born of Mary, who was his real flesh and blood birth mother. When a human baby is forming in his or her mother, that baby is suspended in what? In water, in the fluid, in the mother's abdomen. When it's time for the baby to be born, the woman's water breaks in preparation for the baby to be born in the, into the world. Thus the saying is true that every human being is born of water. So that we clear that up. So when Jesus was born, Jesus was born of water from a flesh and blood mother. He had real human blood flowing through his veins. And it was as if when he came in, a, in what we call the incarnation, I, he was saying, I am one of you. Jesus was fully man because he wanted to completely identify with sinful humanity. And the mystery of Jesus coming into the world was that Jesus did not have a human father and his mother was a virgin. Mary was a virgin. This is such an important part. People miss this that don't know the Lord. They, uh, uh, virgin birth, well, it's some sort of weird thing, but I have no clue what they're talking about or what they mean. Well, Jesus didn't have a human father because Adam was held accountable before God for the sin that came into the world there was a passing on of that sin nature through Adam. Jesus came and was born of a virgin. Jesus did not have a sin nature. Jesus was completely holy and he did not sin. And God Almighty placed himself in mother's Mary's womb. God himself placed himself in Mary's womb. Jesus, as God the Son, was in full unity with God the Father. Jesus said to his disciples in John 10.30 that he and the Father were one. That's what we read. And we see after when Jesus was baptized, that Jesus was also filled with God the Holy Spirit. Because after he went out in the power of the Spirit into his ministry. This is in the Scriptures. Jesus still being a separate person from the Father and the Holy Spirit, was one with them in nature as God. And through Jesus, God created the entire universe. 
all three persons were united without any kind of deviation. When the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit agree on something, they all agree on the same thing. When they disagree on something, they all disagree on the same thing because they are one God. One God. Now, the Trinity is hard for some folks to understand, but this is a truth that we need to grasp as Christians. God in His fullness dwelt in Christ. It wasn't just, uh, you know, a part of God here. You know? So Jesus was fully God. Fully God. Jesus was in His Spirit and in His person fully God. And God is not sinful. There's no shadow of turning with Him. There's no wickedness in God. He doesn't have darkness in Him. And Jesus, despite having human flesh, there was blood flowing through His veins. When He died on the cross, when He was beaten, real blood flowed from His veins. He, he had human flesh, fully, but He was fully God as well as being fully man. All of this was in direct opposition to these Gnostic teachings. And John wanted people to be absolutely clear on the heresy. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't just come by water. He didn't just get planted into Mary's womb with some phantom spirit being that just was sort of implanted into Mary's womb and came out but wasn't really a person. No. Jesus was formed as a man with flesh and blood. He was born of water and of blood. He came into the world for a purpose. See, Jesus did show us what God was like with skin on. He did. Absolutely, he showed us. His teachings in the Word show us the character and, and, and how God is. But Jesus came for a purpose. Jesus came so that he could shed his own blood as a payment for the sins of the world. His own blood was shed in exchange for the guilty blood of all of humanity. This is why, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved the world, so he gave the world. What did he give the world? He gave the world himself. He made himself flesh. He put himself into a fleshly human being and formed into a human in his body here on the earth. For real. When you looked at Jesus, you saw a real man. When you looked at Jesus, you also saw the real God who created all things. This is the mystery. This is the, the beauty of this is that there was no other way for mankind to be saved because everyone is sinners and falls short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus himself was a man, and he is sinless. So the sinless, spotless creator of the world loved us so much that he came down out of majesty with billions of angels at his disposal, made himself flesh so that he could die in your stead. Instead of you, Jesus Christ paid the full penalty for sin and death, and all the world's sin was placed upon his shoulders. And when he died... He died for the salvation of the lost. And who are the lost? Without Christ, that's you and I sitting here today. We've been redeemed. Jesus satisfied God's justice. Uh, the wrath of God was poured out on Christ in full measure. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. This is why the blood of Christ is holy. That's why we do communion and it is so holy. It represents the broken body and blood of Christ which paid the penalty for our death. We rightly deserve to die because we're all sinners. And because of the justice of God, we have this death over us. The penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus' death satisfied God's justice, paid the penalty for sin. And when he started his ministry... When you look at Jesus' ministry starting, he was baptized not because he had to have sins repented of, but because he wanted to show us that he was completely identifying with us as a man and setting an example for us to follow. Jesus was the first 
to be baptized like that. He was the first to be raised from the dead and overcome sin in the grave. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. And God painted a clear picture. When Jesus went to baptize, we're to be baptized, we're told in Matthew 3, 13 to 17, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him. The same John that was writing this, this text that we're looking at this morning uh, wasn't the John that we're talking about. We're talking about John the Baptist here. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this in fulfillment of all righteousness and to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water and at that moment heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him and I am, I am well pleased. <laughs> Beautiful. The Trinity all at once showing Jesus as the Christ and the Savior of the world. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. All in unity. And this is what John meant when he stated in 1 John 5, 9-12, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which He has given about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed in the testimony God has given about His Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. There's only one way to salvation, there's only one way to God, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. God who came to us in the flesh to pay for our sins. You know, there's some stuff going on out there right now that's not good. I've had a couple people um, send me some, a couple different people. You know, our government is putting their agenda of homosexuality and this whole thing of you can be whatever you want to be and, and, and we're going to teach our little children this in the school system and all that. Man, what a tragedy. You go from a Christian, fairly Christian nation anyways, to see this just darkness. You know, we're, we're good and evil are are mixed up and right is wrong and wrong is right and white is black and black is white and you can't tell whatever. I can be whatever I want to be. I can do whatever I want to do and nobody can tell me any otherwise because there is no truth. After all, truth is just what you perceive. You know, truth is to you. It might be true, your truth. This is your truth. This is my truth. All this stuff is going on in our society and it's so, oh, it's like overwhelming when you look at it. And the Bible says that in the last days there's going to be an increase of this kind of stuff happening. And as your pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we've got to love the people in the world. We've got to love and, and do the things that we know we need to do to show them the light of Christ because they're lost. They don't know the right hand from their left. They don't know. So if you've got people that, that you know, are, you know, are going through a sex change or whatever, you still got to love these people. God loves them, right? But we don't, we don't endorse what they're doing. But at the same time, now this... We have an Islamic uh, cleric that's calling for all these people across North America to, um, to uh, march with them in solidarity against, or I guess it's in, not North America, it's Canada, to march with them in solidarity. They're calling for a million-person march where all religions and all faiths gather together to march against this agenda that the government is putting into the school system to educate our kids about LGBTQ issues at a very young age and, and teach them that this is normal and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to band together and march and we're calling on Christians. The Muslims are saying, we're calling on Christians to join with us in ranks. Well, what do we think about that? I'm telling you this much. We're not going to join with the Muslims. We're not going to because they are not born of God. There is no fellowship there. Yes, there is an issue that needs to be dealt with. And you know what? We're going to deal with it as Christians 
Because the Christian way of dealing with this is going to be a whole lot different than the way that the world is going to deal with this. So I'm going to be looking into this, and I will be sending a petition on this issue forward to all of you to have a look at and decide. But it's going to be done in the way of, of, of a Christian what fellowship has light with darkness? We can't join with people in solidarity that are worshiping the devil. Because Allah is not God. They're not on the same level, guys. Allah is not God. Nor is any other idol or any other God God. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And he's not just the white, Caucasian, European God. He is the God of the, of the universe. He is the God of all nations. There's more Christians in China than there are people in Canada. So, you know, like, we've got to get this straight here, guys. We need to stand up and do the right things, but we need to do it in the right way. That's all I'm saying. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And do we hate them because of that? No. If you're out there and you're listening to this out there, or if there's someone here who is Muslim, I don't hate you. I love you. But the way that you're going is not the way to the, the creator of the universe. There is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus died for your sins. In exchange for your sins, he gave you life. And that is the truth. And if you embrace that truth, it will set you free. So we love people, but we don't, we don't endorse the things that are wrong. See? Love, faith, and obedience are all united. We have to have all. The Word of God is what we hold as our standard. So we obey the Word of God, the Bible. Anyways, Ah, I have many more things to say about these issues, but let's uh, bow in a word of prayer this morning as we ask God to help us through this week. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the salvation that you offer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you loved us so much that you gave yourself so that we could have life. And you died in our place, Lord, to give us freedom. So this morning, God, we, we pay you honor, Jesus. And maybe there's someone here today that doesn't know you. And I just pray, God, that today would be the day where they, they believe and they surrender to your spirit. There's someone out there listening online that needs to give their hearts to you, Lord. I pray that they would take a step of faith and believe just let go of all the other things that have been binding and just believe in you, Jesus. Thank you for this day that we can encourage one another and we just pray that you would bless this week as we go out and, and uh, enjoy the last few weeks of this beautiful summer that you've given us here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. It's good to have this Sunday together. May God's grace and peace rest on you this week as you go your separate ways. And we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Amen? God bless you.